Because future-looking statements are inherently subject to risk and uncertainty, our reminder is that you should make any purchasing decisions or investment decisions based on products that are currently commercially available. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Trailhead DX. My name is Chris Peterson, Director of Product Management for Apex at Salesforce. And joining me today is Kevin Porman, a Senior Developer Evangelist at Salesforce. And today, we'd like to talk to you about improving the quality of life. Apex updates to ship better code faster. So today we'll be taking a look at a new Apex language operator that's coming in the winter release, the safe navigation operator. I'll be handing things off to Kevin to do a fairly advanced demo of the transaction finalizers open pilot, including a very exciting framework that's been built on top of it that mimics JavaScript promises. And then we'll be rounding things out at the end with a peek at the Apex roadmap for any and all feedback that you would like to throw our way. And with that, what is Apex? Many of you already know the answer, but some interesting updates about Apex in its history for those of you who already know the basics. Apex is really the solution for writing code server side that runs on the Salesforce platform. If you wanna write a database trigger, if you wanna write a batch Apex job, if you would like to write scheduled Apex, if you'd like to write an LWC controller, or an Aura controller, a Visual Force controller, an email service, or even features that integrate programmatically with declarative, like flow invocable actions, Apex is really the solution for you. At the moment, Apex is running over 105 billion requests per month across all of Salesforce's production fleet. And to make sure that Apex is a robust and stable solution for you to do all of your programmatic development on, we run a process called Hammer, which takes every test our customers and partners have written and runs them every release. At last count, for the summer release that's rolling out right now, we run, ran 240 million of your tests to make sure we didn't break anything. And yes, they did actually catch a couple of regressions that we fixed before you ever got to know about that. So thank you all for your help in making Salesforce successful. Beyond that, I'd also like to highlight that Apex was first released in 2006 and impressively is still able to run code from 2006. Between API versioning and things like Hammer, we've managed to maintain strict backwards compatibility that whole time. So we like to think of Apex as a wonderful tool for writing code that, while well, I'm not gonna say needs no maintenance, needs very little maintenance compared to other programmatic solutions that are available in the enterprise software space. So with that introduction out of the way, we'd like to dive right into the meat of the presentation today, the safe navigation operator. Some of you are familiar with Kotlin or C Sharp, or a number of other languages have similar constructs, may already be familiar with this. If you're not, what it does is if the left-hand side of the expression is not null, then does whatever dot would do. That can be invoke a method, dereference a property or a field, etc. And if it is null, just returns null. No null pointer exceptions, no try catch, no need for explicit null checks. And so this is a really beneficial quality of life improvement, as I'll show you in just a second, because what used to require multiple explicit is not null checks can really be simplified down and inlined, no tries, no catches, no, ca no conditional blocks into something that's much more graceful and really just saves you a lot of boilerplate code, which is a theme that you've seen in many of my conversations lately. So how does this work? Here on screen, you'll see a class called character. We see one noteworthy method in this class, get character hobbies from cache. You'll notice that we're using platform cache and we are fetching our partition dynamically. So anytime we're doing anything dynamically, we really should be prepared for it not to exist. And that's exactly the first thing you see here. If the partition doesn't exist, we bail out and return null. Following that, we actually fetch a complex apex type from the cache. And then again, we handle null. If you look at this code, you see a recurring theme. The vast majority of this method's complexity and verbosity is in null handling. So let's take a look at how we could use safe navigation to really simplify things. So let's be bold. Let's make this a one-liner. Let's start with a return statement. So we know that cache is a namespace and org is a class. Those won't be null. So we don't have to worry about safe navigation off of those. So let's get partition call as fine as it is. So let's add a safe navigation call and get rid of this whole block of code. Just delete that right out of the way. We're gonna move our cast. 
because we still do need the cast. Move it over here, nest it in some parentheses, and right after the get call. So, get rid of part. We don't need to store that in the local variable anymore. And what do we have? Well, not quite the final implementation because we want to return the hobbies, not the complex character details type. But you can imagine where we're going next. Let's get rid of all this code. Oh, that's glorious to delete that much code. Get hobbies. Gone. And just like that, we've refactored that whole method into a single line. Admittedly, a longer line than you might like, but at the end of the day, what did we do? We got rid of multiple explicit null checks in our method. We made sure that we kept the same guarantees about safe handling of nulls, but we did it in a way where we didn't have to write multiple extra conditionals and where the only extra syntax is really two question marks. We got rid of multiple local variables. So we dramatically simplified the experience of developing this code. And we hope that that's exactly what will happen in practice in your code bases as well, is that the level of complexity and time and thought you put into handling nulls will drop dramatically. With that, I'd like to hand things off to Kevin to talk about transaction finalizers in the Promises framework. All right, thanks, Chris. I'm really looking forward to using the safe navigation operator, though I think we should call it the maybe operator. What do you think? Let me know. I want to show you a feature that's currently in OpenPilot called Apex Finalizers. OpenPilot means you can use it in your scratch orgs, but not in production. Finalizers solve one of the biggest pain points with asynchronous code and development, making sure that that code is executed in order. Finalizers also offer us an elegant way to build promises in Apex. If you're not familiar with promises from other languages, they're a way of providing flow control and error handling to asynchronous work. Let's build a finalizer that we can use with promises. All right, you can see that I've stubbed out these classes. I've got one called chain. This is our actual finalizer that we're gonna be reusing to implement promises. So if you look here, you can see that it implements finalizer. And to implement finalizer, you have to have an execute finalizer context method, right? So we've got that here. There's no logic in it. You can see I've also got a constructor that accepts a list of promises or an array of promises and a pass through object. We'll get to that here in a bit. But that array of promises is really important because arrays are ordered. We're going to use that ordering of arrays in order to provide and ensure that our promises or our pieces of the promise chain are run properly in order. All right, so let's look at filling out this execute. Now, I want to do something clever with this. I want to see what happens if I can specify when it succeeds versus when it fails. And to do that, I'm going to do a switch statement, which is still one of my favorite things, switch on. And then I'm going to call our context object that we get, dot get result. And I'm going to say when, and these are uh, enums, so success like that, success, just success. And I'll make that pretty. And I'll say uh, if we have another one. So if this dot promises dot uh, size size uh, is greater than zero. So if we have another promise in our chain, then we're going to immediately pop it off. So we'll say promise. And we'll call it next is equal to this dot promises dot uh, remove zero. Now remove is similar to pop in other languages. And then we're going to say next dot promises. So we're going to set the next promise promises array is equal to um, and it's going to be this dot promises. So whatever's left. And then we're going to say next dot not next next dot um, pass through is equal to pass through our pass through object like that. Okay. Now here's the magic because in a finalizer, we can enqueue uh, one, uh, another batch job or queueable, et cetera. And we're going to turn around and use this to enqueue the next, um, one, the next promise we just pulled off. So to do that, we'll say system dot enqueue and job. And we'll say next like that. And that's how we handle the success portion of it. Now, if we wanted to, we can also do when uh, six, when um, it's actually called unhandled exception. Unhandled exception. Like that. And here we're just going to do a system debug for right now. 
we'll say uh, parent queuable had an exception. Uh, and then we'll just put in that exception. And to do that, we're going to do context.get exception. And then we'll do dot get message. Like that. All right, so we can save that. And that's going to actually handle the, this is our finalizer that's handling the bit of starting the next one in the chain. Okay, so now we need to work at a, um, at a class that will orchestrate all of this. Now to orchestrate all of this in conjunction with that finalizer called chain, I've got a class called promise. Now you notice this is an abstract class because I expect other people, other developers to be able to take and derive from this to extend it. And I'm going to have this class implement queuable and database that allows callouts. So from a promise implementing class, I can queue it and I can also make a callout. Now you'll notice this looks very familiar to what we had in the chain. We've got a list of promises and we're going to guarantee that it's always at least an empty list. And then we've also got a pass through object. We've also got an abstract public void execute method. More on that in a bit. And then we've got this. This is our syntactic sugar that makes promises incredibly useful to follow and understand. And that is the then method. And to this then method is really simple. And all it's going to do is it's going to add an object to our list of promises to execute, okay? So when you say then, we pass it in an instance of a promise uh, conforming class and it will be added to our list of promises to be executed. So while this is terribly simple in terms of what it does, it actually provides a lot of syntactic sugar that makes it much easier to read the code. Now this class also has to have an execute because it implements queuable. So let's look at what we're going to do here. And the first thing we're going to do is call the execute method. Now, what's up with that? Well, what we're doing is we're calling the execute method that the developers who are using this promise have extended and written themselves. And we've made that required by saying abstract rather than virtual. Now, we've also got the finalizer here, and this is where we're going to take and attach a finalizer to our queuable. This is the step that you can use regardless of whether or not you're using promises. When you have a queuable that you want to add a finalizer to, you have to call this system.attach finalizer chain. Now, this is one of the key gotchas with finalizers. You can only attach one finalizer per queuable. You can reuse that finalizer, and you can have multiple queuables with different finalizers, but one queuable per finalizer. Now, if we look here, you're going to see that I'm going to call the chain and I'm going to pass in the current values of promises and pass through to that chain. And that is what's going to pass that back into our chain object, which will then say, oh, OK, this one succeeded. I'm going to pop this one off and go to the next one. So let's save this and let's look at what it looks like to actually run that. This is a demo promise class. As the name implies, it just demonstrates how promises work and how everything comes together. You'll see that it extends promise, which is our orchestration class that we looked at just before. It has a constructor that just takes an account ID, and then it has an execute method. That execute method is required because it derives from or extends queuable. So as we look through here, we can see that we're just doing a bit of work by grabbing an account and incrementing its account or on that account. So not a lot of work there, but it is something that can be done asynchronously. And if we switch over to the test for it, we can see how it does things in order. So let's look at this here and we can see here that we've got a, a test called then test. Now I've got my account that I'm going to grab. I'm going to create a new demo promise with the account ID. And then I'm going to set my pass through integer to zero. That pass through integer is a way to pass in information into the queuable chain. So we're going to set it to zero. And then we're going to call the then method with a new demo promise account ID. So the same thing, but again. And then we're going to chain it by saying then with a new demo promise with the account ID. So we're going to be doing this three times, zero, one, and two. And what we're going to do is we're going to enqueue that first job and run, let it run. Because our chain automatically runs the next one, and because promise automatically attaches the finalizer, we now have a very nice step-by-step -step process where we go through the array one by one. So now we can go at the end of this, we can look and see what this runs. You see the first time our account runs, our account is created, it has a zero for the shipping street, or excuse me, yeah, shipping street. Now it's going to be incremented three times because we ran that promise three times in a row. 
pretty cool. Thanks for tuning in to hear all about the new Apex features. I'm sure with Safe Navigation Operator and Apex Finalizers, you'll be able to write safer code faster. One last thing, I'd like you to go kick the tires a bit. Go play with Apex Finalizers. See how promises work. Are they a good use case for what your company is doing? Give me a shout out. Hit me on Twitter at CodeFryer. Thanks for that, Kevin. And jumping over to the last thing I promised you'd see today, a peek at the Apex roadmap. You'll see a number of ident items identified as coming soon, really winter 21, unless something changes. I'll refer you back to the forward-looking statement slide at the beginning of the presentation. Coming up, a number of items that we expect to be able to do in the one or two releases following that, so spring or summer 21. And then longer term is really what's on the backlog after that. Things that we haven't identified explicit blockers to and expect to start work on in earnest as we have capacity for it. And beneath that, a list of things that we're exploring, things that we have identified blockers to, and we're starting work on mitigating those so that we can really deliver the features that you're looking for. We'd love your feedback. Feel free to share it. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining us, Trailhead DX, and enjoy the rest of your day. Accenture has always made our people a top priority, but with over 20,000 Salesforce professionals, traditional training methods just weren't enough. Combining research, strategy, and technology, we created our forever learning program. We use tools like My Trailhead, and with a global network of champions, mentors, and study squads, Accenture is transforming our learning culture. Culture change starts with a conversation. To learn more about bringing forever learning to your company, visit Accenture.com Salesforce. Did you know most of the time we all have positive intent, but sometimes it's the impact of our actions and words that can do harm to others? We all make mistakes, but we can commit to remembering it's the impact, not the intent that matters. Skilling up on equality makes us a stronger community. Learn more on Trailhead and earn an inclusive marketing practices badge.